Bishops had a plan whereby victims were silenced, pedophile priests were protected, and none of this was ever reported to civil authorities or revealed to the general public. But, Phil, what I don't understand, if this was disseminated to bishops throughout the United States, how come it's remained secret this long? It doesn't surprise me at all. There's a lot of secrecy within the Vatican. For example, if you look at this document, it's filled with terms like secret archives and perpetual silence and destroying evidence, secret of the Holy Office. I'm just tremendously relieved that finally the document has surfaced and it's being given the attention that it warrants. Let me put up a statement made by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. This is what they said. I'm going to read it out loud. A 40-year-old document of the former Holy Office issued March 16, 1962, is being portrayed by some in and outside the media as a smoking gun, allegedly proving that there was a ground plan for covering up the crime of sexual abuse of minors by clerics. The essential point in response to those making this claim is they are taking the document entirely out of context, therefore distorting it completely. Your thoughts? I don't think it's being taken out of context at all. It talks very clearly about investigating crimes against children, swearing all sides to secrecy. There's one part of this document that talks about the victim being forced to put his hands on the Bible and swear that he would keep this a secret under the threat of excommunication. I mean, what they say in response is this does nothing to prevent and was not an indication that they wanted people to prevent filing civil charges against the alleged victimizer. Do you think that's true or do you think that's simply false? I don't see the connection, really. Well, the Church is saying that this document doesn't really say anything about pursuing civil cases or stopping victims from going to authorities. Do you think it does? Well, I think it does because the victim is sworn to secrecy. I mean, there's not even a provision in here for a victim who might want to need to go to see a therapist, for example. I mean, I think this is a very hostile document in the way it treats victims, in the way it has no sort of concern for the victim's emotional health or their need to heal from this experience. Do you think this impacts future lawsuits, lawsuits that are ongoing now? I mean, you know, there have been some suits in which some diocese declared bankruptcy or threatened to declare bankruptcy, basically said we don't have the money. There are those who would say, well, if you can link this to the Vatican, obviously there's more money there. Is this going to play into that? You know, I'm not a lawyer, Anderson, but I can tell you that from my interpretation of this, it does show that the secrecy goes right to the top of the Vatican. And if this is something that the lawyers can use, I think it should be tested. And I think many survivors, as well as many faithful Catholics, whose trust in the Church has been shattered this past year, will be very eager to see how this all plays out. I'm curious, what went through your mind? I mean, this has been such a, I mean, this has obviously transformed your life. It's something you think about all the time, I'm sure. When you heard about this document, what was the first thing that went through your mind? Well, I had heard rumors of this document for several years, and I had often wondered how it was that each bishop in each diocese was pretty much operating the same way in terms of moving priests from parish to parish and, you know, having victims sign confidentiality agreements. The effort was always on secrecy and protecting the priest. And I thought it was very curious that each bishop was acting the same way. And now this sort of answers that, because it shows that perhaps there was a document or a plan that everybody was working from. Well, it's a fascinating document. It's really still a developing story, one we're going to be following closely. I'd like to say that if your viewers want to see the document, they can log on to our website, survivorsnetwork.org, and there's a link right on the home page that will take them directly into the document, and they can judge for themselves. All right. Phil Salviano, I appreciate you joining us. Hello. My name is Jeffrey Hodgson, and I am the Grand Master of Masons in Massachusetts. As the presiding officer of 40,000 Masons and 250 lodges throughout our Commonwealth, 
It is my pleasure to welcome you to AskAFreemason.org, and thank you for taking the time to learn more about Freemasonry. Freemasonry aims to promote friendship, morality, and brotherly love among its members. It is, by definition, a fraternity comprised of men from every race, religion, opinion, and background who come together as brothers to develop and strengthen the bonds of friendship. As Freemasons, we are part of a centuries-old tradition of great men who changed our world in ways both large and small. For example, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Revere, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, and astronaut and Senator John Glenn were all Masons before achieving the success we recognize them for. There are countless other great men whose names are not as well known. They became better men and made their families workplaces, and communities better because they join the Mason. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Hodgson, and I am the Grand Master of Masons in Massachusetts. Thank you. 